Our liberties we prize and our rights we will maintain. This is Iowa Civil Rights History Podcast, where we tell stories about the contribution Iowans and the state of Iowa has made to advance the civil rights movement. Past stories are being told, present actions will be highlighted, and preparation for the future will be discussed. Here is your host, Eric Nyange. Welcome to the Iowa Civil Rights History Podcast, coming to you from James Jordan House, which is located at 2001 Fuller Road in West Des Moines, Iowa. It is one of the Iowa Underground Railroad houses that is still standing and was one of John Brown Freedom Trail. The house was built and owned by James Jordan. James Jordan was a complicated man like most men of his time. He was born in West Virginia in 1813 and moved to Iowa in 1845. He was once a slave catcher in Virginia and he became abolitionist. He was Iowa state lawmaker and he was federal lawbreaker. While he was making law in Iowa state legislature, he was also breaking the Federal Fugitive Slave Law Act by assisting slaves to get to freedom. He went even farther by helping and assisting the infamous Johnny Brown to do the same. I came to the James Jordan house today to understand a little bit about this man, his life, and his thought process. My guest today is none other than the executive director of the West Des Moines Historic Society, Gail Brubaker. Gail, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Thanks Eric. for taking your time today. I'm thrilled to have you here at the Jordan House Museum. How did you get interested in James Jordan? Well, I've always loved history. I've worked at a variety of for-profit and non-profit organizations in town, was approached to be a tour guide here, studied the script, practiced and all of that, and then it just worked out in pretty rapid succession that I was able to gain new positions, and now I'm the executive director for the West Des Moines Historical Society, owns and manages this museum, and a one-room schoolhouse museum that we have just down the street. What's what's the school museum? It is called Bennett School. It's one of the very last country schools or one-room schools that was built here in Polk County. It was in danger of being torn down in the late 80s, early 90s. So the West Des Moines Historical Society worked with other groups, organizations, and the West Des Moines School District And we picked it up and moved it next to Jordan Creek Elementary. At one point, Iowa had over 14,000 one-room schoolhouses, but they're not needed anymore with consolidation and things like that. So they wanted to build a car wash where Bennett School used to be, and we wanted to save it. And it's really a great piece of history because it's right next to an elementary school, so we can do this great comparison contrast between education then and education now. Interesting. And there's still plenty of people who went to or taught at one-room schoolhouses because it's not that far away. Bennett School was built in 1926 or 1927. So actually when they moved it, they were able to interview a bunch of people who did go to school there. And we have all of their stories that we share with folks when they come on a tour. Oh, wow. And I'm sure schooling back then is completely different than Oh, yes. School we see today. Yes. Even something as simple as the blackboards. Mm. There are kids who have never written on a blackboard with chalk. And they think that is just... (laughs) They might not even know what that is. That's thrilling to them. It's one way to get them to be quiet. You threaten to scratch your fingernails down the chalkboard. All the adults in the room just cringe and cover their ears, but the kids don't Don't know know. what that sound is. So (laughs) I take great pleasure in introducing them to that sound. (laughs) Yeah. How long have you been the director of this museum? Well, I've been here six years. I've okay. been the executive director for about three. Okay. I am one of two employees. Uh, I have a part-time administrator who is fantastic. Mm. Her name is Kelly. Couldn't do what I do without her. Mm. Shout out to Kelly. Yeah, we are a team. And I have a wonderful group of tour guides who are smart They love to learn new things. So one of them is taking classes at Drake. She had an African-American study class. Every week I'm getting sent links to (laughs) videos that the teacher... Did you know about this? Oh my gosh, I feel like I've taken the class. (laughs) But she, you know, this is the kind of stuff they do. 
you want people who are doing tour to be super excited about yeah. it. Yeah, and they are. Yeah. And it's, you know, when we were closed to the public for those two months, obviously we didn't do any tours. So the tour guides didn't get to tell the stories. And that's half the fun. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. we go off script. Question. Oh, yeah. yeah. And everybody has something that they're more passionate about. Yeah. You know, I've got one person who loves architecture. So she's pointing out different aspects outside that are modeled inside and you know and i'm like okay that's nice but here's what i think is really cool so you're never going to get the exact same tour but i mean there's basic information that everybody knows and has to pass on but i'm really passionate about like the photograph of cynthia in the parlor and why people didn't smile when they had pictures taken at that time and i think There are important lessons about how you are recorded for posterity in that. Mm. What it takes for somebody to be a tour guide? You have to be reasonably independent. You have to be willing to learn the script, even though, as I said, everybody takes from that. You have to get the basics down. Okay. You have to like to talk to people. Mm. So the script is what are you created about what this house is about? Exactly. Every room, the key points or things that we need to get across. It is not just reciting names, dates, and numbers. It is telling stories and bringing, I really try to bring the humanity of yeah. the Jordan family forward because at the end of the day, these were real live people who laughed and cried and bled, weren't that different from mm. you and me. Yeah, that's true. That's very true. So, James Jordan, who is the man on this house, who who was James Jordan? If you have to tell somebody, never heard of him. He was one of the influential early Iowans. He was one of the very first permanent Anglo-European settlers to central Iowa. He was a deeply religious man. He was Methodist, and part of a lot of their teachings were abolitionist meanings uh, or causes. They, along with Quakers and Calvinists, had a very strong belief in abolition. He is a man who was originally from Virginia. It's a part of the state that is now West Virginia. When his father died, his mom got all the kids together, many of them adults with their own families, and they made the decision that there is no way they could continue to live in a state that allowed slavery. He made his way west and ended up here in the territory of Iowa, and went on to be a state legislator, a Polk County supervisor. He is the reason why we have Valley Junction, because he worked with compatriots to bribe the railroad to come here and gave the land that we now know as Fifth Street, as Valley Junction. Oh, wow. He built the first public schools, built Mm. a couple churches, so he was very community-minded and wanted to give back. He moved from Virginia. Yes, sir. The hotbed of uh, slavery. Was he a slave catcher before he became abolitionist? Unfortunately, he did have to help with a family member's uh, slave hunt. There were a couple of enslaved individuals who made a run for freedom. And if you've grown up in the country, you know when a neighbor needs help, you help. You you help. You have that kind of societal obligation. So he did help. But he wrote about it later and what a gut-wrenching experience it was for him personally. Do you think that experience probably is what pushed him to become I think it did. abolitionist? I think he had a really strong background and, and firm foundation in the belief. Mm. And seeing the faces of these two human beings who were not regarded as human beings but as property, yeah. you know, falling to their knees, begging God to save them. That would yeah. rip you up. Mm-hmm. So what year did he move to Iowa? They came up here basically in 1845 and then made the permanent move up here when the territory was open for legal settlement. Okay. You know, and that's a story that you mentioned our basement here where we have a lot of our Underground Railroad information. We are going to be expanding that to also include information about the indigenous people that were here. That's another part of West Des Moines history that we need to tell. So when they were kicked off of Mm -hmm. their land and Jordan and the other Anglo-European settlers came here, he and his brother originally came up here and everybody moved up here and they started 
living in a tent and a lean-to and just out in the front yard underneath those fantastic trees, mm-hmm. digging out the basement, and then built the first part of the house in 1850. Wow. He had a lot of kids. He did. Well, he had, Like what, 13? Uh, he had 11. 11. But he was, they were also taking care of their niece and nephew, mm. his brother James. Brother James and John married two sisters. So James married Melinda, and John married Drusilla. And unfortunately, Drusilla died a couple weeks after giving birth to her third child. So his brother John left his son and daughter with James and Melinda, and he went off to the California gold fields. Then when Melinda passed away at 35, John came back to get his kids, but it took a while. Obviously. So thankfully, there were enough older kids and neighbors who could step in and help until James was able to remarry a year later. Cynthia was his second wife, and she she only had five kids. (laughs) That's that's true. I mean, in 19th century, that's not many kids at all. No, it's really not. Yeah. So Melinda was his first wife, and then she died. Yes. Do we know what she died you know, uh, we don't, and records are so kind of tentative uh, or it, it, sketchy at that time. What I like to say on tours, she was 35 years old. She was pregnant with her fourth child when they moved up here and started living in a tent, and she had the opportunity to take a break, and I don't blame her. Six yeah. kids, yeah, it's, I'm done. Yeah, that's yeah, that's that's. Gosh, I can I can imagine the wear and tear of women back then. Oh, it's absolutely. And that's something else that we've really started talking about is the role of women because mm-hmm. their stories are not told. Told. As you walk around the house right now, we have an exhibit celebrating four Iowa women who are part of the Underground Railroad. They don't get celebrated because their names aren't put in documents. Mm -hmm. If they are recorded in newspapers, it's under their husband's name. And that's one of the problems that genealogists and historians have trouble with. You're talking about Mrs. James Jordan. Well, which one is it? Mm -hmm. And there were lots of times when husbands had more more than one wife. I mean, it was just a fact of life. life, But they were just as involved. They did a lot of work behind the scenes. They would have regular get-togethers with neighbors and put together food packets and clothing packets and knit socks and things like that. So people, as they were on their way north to Canada, would Mm. have food and clothing. Mm -hmm. So their contributions are just as valid and important, I think. Yeah. Did he live in Missouri? Yes, he yeah. did. He okay. Did. Was was that from Virginia to Missouri, then to Iowa? No, they popped around. Um, they went from Virginia to Ohio, Michigan, where they met the Pittman sisters. And, you know, each time they bought property and they farmed, uh, mm. James Jordan made the majority of his money through shorthorn cattle. But they had pigs and other, other critters. They also had a general store. Uh, so in Missouri, they were kind of right along the line of people that were going west in wagon trains, going out to California and Oregon. So they were able to glean a lot of information about what life was going to be like out there. And that was apparently the goal. The U.S. government was really pushing for settlers to go out to the West Coast, that manifest destiny, get people out there. But then the territory of Iowa opened up. That's a heck of a lot closer. Um, What we have been told is if you've ever been to the Kansas City airport, that's where the Jordan farm was in Missouri. Oh, really? So. Okay. When the last Jordan family member moved out of this house and sold it in 1947, there was a lot. Oh, it's not that long ago, huh? No, not really. Visitors can actually meet that gentleman, Robert Roy Jordan Jr. Upstairs, we have a new exhibit, West Des Moines at War, which was started because the family donated his World War II bomber jacket mm. back to us. So okay. we we did research on it. But there was all of this stuff that was left in the house, yeah. like papers and things. Who cares? James Jordan died in 1893, so nobody's going to want to read that. So everything was gathered up, and they had a big bonfire in the front yard. Oh, gosh. So who knows what was written that could be read today. 
So that breaks my heart. That's one of those. I, can I go back in time and start smacking oh, things out of people's gosh. hands? I cringe when I hear that. Oh, it just. Ooh. But there are still Jordan family members around who have some papers and letters. And I've seen, I've seen photocopies of them. And I just, I hope that they make their way back here to the West Des Moines Historical mm. Society because we want to share this history. Yeah. One of the things we really pushed last year, we were in the middle of history. COVID was horrific tragedy, but it was also history. Mm -hmm. So every single person was living an incredibly rare, valid experience. So we really pushed people to keep diaries, video yeah. diaries, or, or write things down, or artwork, or save your kids' homeschooling schedule. And they sent them to us, and they are now part of our permanent record. You're right, because I, I, I didn't think about that until you say because now we go back in history, like read about the pandemic that happened in the past. Yeah. If people didn't keep the record, we wouldn't know much about it. No, not at all. Yeah, because so, we don't look at this like historic moment. No, we're just trying to get through Yeah, each and every day. But 100 years from now, it's going to be. It's going to be really important. And they're going to want to know how do we deal with you went from, you know, going into the office eight to five to be working remotely mm -hmm. and being a school teacher. That needs to be remembered and celebrated because, oh, my gosh, we went, we survived it. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's really one of the pivots that we have done in the last couple of years as a historical society. Share the lessons of what we learned, but also understand that we're making those lessons now for the future. Yeah. And we all have a responsibility because we're all part of history. It's yeah. you and me and everyone else. Oh, yeah, that's true. Now, talking about history, do you think James Jordan knew he was making a history or he was just do what he would? He got he had to do. You know, I don't know if he thought about it in those terms. I mean, he was an incredibly successful businessman and very influential. I don't know if he had the thought of, are there going to be two people sitting at my dining room table? <laughs> talking about me. Talking about me. Yeah. I, oh. That's really hard to say. Yeah. Oh, is, was he even thinking about this house would still be standing? No, today. I bet. And it's it's kind of a miracle that it is. Yeah. Because it was in such bad shape that in 1970, the city of West Des Moines was going to set it on fire as a practice burn. We don't respect our history. Yeah. And I understand because it was apparently in really bad shape. It had been used as hay and grain storage for a dairy that was across the street. So the rats and mice and raccoons were apparently pretty happy in here. Um, one of the artifacts we have here in the house is a lithograph of Abraham Lincoln, which apparently hung in, in his office until he died, which was, again, 1893. If you are worried about bringing potential business partners into your home and you have a picture of a man who was absolutely despised by half of this country, I think that shows a strength yeah. of character. Yeah. Yeah. I don't care if yeah. you don't agree with me on this. Yeah, I am. This, this is what I believe it. I was a Whig. I'm a Republican. If you don't like it, get out. Mm. So that's one of those, one of those lessons that objects can teach us. You look at it, and it's a picture of Abraham Lincoln. But when you start thinking about the context of it, there is more there that's saying about the person who owned it and lived in this house than just a framed object hanging on a wall. Mm. You probably say you can counsel me if you want to. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's, he, I just, I love that attitude. And I'm, yeah. you know, I'm projecting a little bit, I know. Mm. But if you're trying to hide what you're doing, you're not going to have something like that up on your wall. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So. You mentioned a little bit about the Native American, that he played part of yes. helping them to get their land back. Talk a little bit about that, because that's the piece I did not know anything about him with the Native American. The Meskwaki and Fox tribes, I believe, are the only ones who have been able to return to their traditional homeland, and they purchased their land back. I don't know of the years of that exactly, but James Jordan was in the Iowa legislature at the time, and he supported the legislation to legally allow them to purchase their land and move back in to territory that they had been forced to give up through treaties with the U.S. government. Yeah. 
he was the lawmaker mm-hmm. and also the lawbreaker mm-hmm. at the same time. How do you make of that? I think it just speaks to the complexity of human beings. Mm. That's a lesson that we teach a lot to school groups that come in, rule breaker versus rule maker. Which way is more effective to create change, mm. positive change in your world? You know, he was able to make laws that benefited the indigenous people. On the other hand, he did not agree with the Fugitive Slave Act or yeah. slavery. So it was breaking that law. Yeah. But what could he do on a federal level? I mean, he helped write the first constitution, the first state constitution, yeah. which states clearly no loopholes. There will never be slavery in Iowa. We will never be a slave state. That's mm-hmm. not to say that there weren't enslaved people here that were brought up from Missouri or, you know, but legally s- enslavement would not be allowed in this state. So yeah. th- he tried to make rules. How is he going to influence national law? He can't. So he got Can, around it. Mm-hmm. When was this house built? Right now in the dining room, we are in the new part of the house. The very first part of the house was built in 1850. Okay. And it was honestly just a farmhouse. There are two rooms in the basement, two on the first floor, two on the second floor. So mm. six rooms only. 1872 is about the same time period, coincidentally or not, that the Iowa governor's man, what we now know as the Iowa governor's mansion, Terrace Hill, was built. And Hoyt Sherman was building his amazing house in what is now known as Sherman Hill. James Jordan was contemporaries, uh, friends, working partners with a lot of these people. And when you compare Terrace Hill with a six-room farmhouse, it's it's not quite up to standard. And it's also about the same time that his oldest daughter was getting married. So that's when they added the 10 rooms on to make it 16 rooms. Okay. And this is the one of the four houses that are still standing for the Iowa Underground Railroad? Yeah, I believe that okay. it's part of the John Brown Freedom Trail. Yes, yeah. there are a lot more locations that are on there, but it's towns like Dalmanutha that are just a wide spot in the road and a plaque mm-hmm. now. So I think that's why the house is important. Yeah. I mean, architecturally, it's fantastic, but it is a visual symbol for the fight for freedom. Yeah. Now, this was one of the route for the uh, freedom seekers or slaves. Yes, sir. This house. Where, if you can kind of tell me, how did how was he able to hide slaves in here? He didn't. He didn't. That's one of those misconceptions. Okay. Um, you got to put yourself back in that time. And when you drive by the house now, you know, we're surrounded by businesses and warehouses and Fuller Road's a pretty busy road. Mm-hmm. None of that was here. That was a stagecoach path or road. There were no other neighbors around. He didn't need to hide people in the house. He ended up owning uh, 1,800 acres of land. So he raised cattle. So he had barns and cornfields and outbuildings. It would have been suicidal for both James Jordan and for the freedom seekers to be in this house. house. At that time, everyone assumes that they hid in the basement. During that time, there was only one entrance and exit into that basement. The stairs our visitors use now weren't built. So all it would take is one man with a gun standing blocking the door, and you're trapped in the basement. Meanwhile, and we do know this is what happened because John Brown and John Teasdale and other people that were involved in this last group that came through in 1859, they had horse-drawn wagons, and they stayed in and under those wagons overnight at the top of the hill. That is, it is not part of our property but you can see it and walk up there. It's mm. kind of near where the original Jordan Family Cemetery is, oh. which is now a city of West Des Moines Cemetery. So they wouldn't, the freedom seekers wouldn't want to be hiding here in the house either. They would be trapped. Mm-hmm. You would much rather be in a cornfield where yeah. you can see that cloud of dust that indicates a posse is coming to get you. Mm-hmm. And if you're James and, Jordan, you don't want them hiding in the house either because you lose all plausible deniability. Yeah, and plus the slave catcher will know this would be the first place to come because they already know your views. Exactly. They'll and be knocking on your door right away. According to family stories, the slave catchers did come here 
a lot. Yeah, oh, yeah. And John Brown was here more than just twice because he talk, was going back and forth. Yeah, talk about their relationship. How much do we know about? We don't really know. Um, just great mutual respect. <laughs> but there's... A, law, a lawmaker and a lawbreaker. Mm-hmm. Have mutual respect. Well, you know, we call Brown an action abolitionist. He was tired of people talking. Yeah. Just do something about it. Yeah, he he believed that the slavery will not end unless there's violence. Yes. And his raid on Harper's Ferry and subsequent hanging yeah. certainly pushed pushed that to the edge, didn't oh, it? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I like to say, you know, John Brown was really considered insane by a lot of people. He not only believed that human beings should not be held in bondage, he also believed that women were equal be, yeah. and should be given the vote immediately. Yeah. So there, obviously, he's crazy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right now, we look back and be like, oh, no, he was not insane. But at that time. Ooh. Yeah. Now it's a no-brainer. They did not care for him. I have had somebody on the tour who was from south of the Mason-Dixon, and I asked, you know, because high school history is a long time ago for some people. Mm-hmm. If they remember the story of John Brown and this guy stood up and said, Oh, do you mean that murdering thief? Like, Oh, this Mm -hmm. is going to be interesting. Mm -hmm. He had a family member who was a slave owner who was killed by John Brown. He was just reciting this family story. He had obviously didn't believe in slavery either, but John Brown has come down through the generations of his family as being a a terrorist. Yeah. Yeah. So. And, and even, yeah, like you say, even today, people still have mixed emotion of John Brown. Yeah. There's people who held him as hero. There's people who held him as villain. Yeah. How far are you justified in supporting your cause? It depends what side you're on. Exactly. If you're a slave, John Brown is a hero. He's, if you're a slave owner, he's a villain. Yep. Again, that's that dichotomy in human beings. Mm-hmm. We're all so complex. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Did he stay in this house twice? He was here at least twice with groups of enslaved people that we can document. Again, that's going back to that documentation. We know that he stayed here. It was just on his travels. Like, he lived in upstate New York. So Mm -hmm. he was going to Tabor and Civil Bend back and forth. So, yes, he did stop here and benefited from the Jordan family's hospitality. Yeah. But since he wasn't escorting a group of freedom seekers at the time um that's not kind of part of what we can celebrate okay. as much yeah but i mean the fact that we probably sit in a place that john brown maybe that we walk we're, yeah and that's one of the things i like to say when you come to any historical house museum you're walking in the actual footsteps of history mm-hmm. you're touching floorboards john brown walked on yeah i just think that's that's incredible. Amazing That's to think incredible. about. Do we know which which part of this home was uh, James Jordan's favorite place? Everybody got their favorite place at home. You know, <laughs> I am going to assume that it, uh, his library slash office. Okay. If you come here and see, you, it is a very masculine room, and that's where the portrait of Abraham Lincoln hung mm. his whole life. I'm going to guess that that would be... And it's the only room other than the kitchen in the basement that has a fireplace. Yeah. So I can see in the winter it being a really cozy place. And actually, the modern kitchen and his office were their own separate buildings before 1872 when the rest of the house was added to. Okay. So it was important to him to have that that space for meetings early on. We touch a little bit about his wife, his first wife, Melinda. Mm Mm-hmm. Back in 19th century, when James Jordan doing all these uh, activities, if he's hiding slaves at the, this barn or this mm-hmm. barn, she had to know what's going on because she controlled the kitchen. Yes. What else do we know about her? Very little because they weren't, their thoughts weren't recorded. That's not to say never. One of these women of the Underground Railroad, Dr. Julius uh, Stillman, She was one of the very first women in the country to get a medical license. And she was in Iowa as part of the Underground Railroad. Her stories were written down, but that is really rare. There is one person, um, this is kind of a side project that we've been working on called Forever Free. And it is a project to identify people and places that are part of the Underground Railroad. And we're 
focused on central Iowa. So it is a mentoring project where we have historians help very high-level high school and college students do this amazingly technical research to discover these people's stories. So, I mean, they're sorting through birth records, death records, enlistment records, and discovering these stories of freedom seekers and people here in Iowa. And I'm hearing stories about people I have never heard of before. All but one of those is a man. The only one who is a woman, Delia Webster, is very well known. She was called the Petticoat Abolitionist. She wrote a book after she went to federal prison for being part of the Underground Railroad. That's how we know about her. But when you go look around these old cemeteries, you will see headstones where the husband and wife are buried. Mm. The wife's name isn't on the headstone. All it says is wife of John Smith. She doesn't even get her her own name on a headstone. How much oral stories somebody like Melinda did have, we lost it. It's sad. And, you know, the Jordan family, when they come here for reunions and stuff, we hear some of those stories, but we can't tell them in an official capacity Mm -hmm. because we have, it's a family story and oral tradition. Yeah. You know, there's a, Fantastic one about James Jordan and John Brown and the sheriff. I love that story. I can't tell it to visitors because I've got no way to prove it. Mm. So when the mic is off, I'll tell you. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Now, why should we care about this house? Why don't we just, this is a nice spot. We can bulldoze this house and build ice cream parlor here. Okay. It would be nice. Do we do that with all of our history? Interesting question. I would like to think as a society we know what is worth celebrating. And Mm. I I don't necessarily know that a physical object is critical to telling the story. Yeah. But I think this story is really important to remember. If it went away as a house, which it almost did just as a building, that would suck from a historical standpoint because this is one of the very oldest buildings in the whole county. As a visual reminder of Iowa's place in history and that there are people who are willing to break unjust laws to help fellow human beings, I think this house is critical. I think about the other spots that are part of the John Brown Freedom Trail and the Underground Railroad that don't exist anymore. 30-year-old plaque that hasn't been washed except by the rain and Mm. nobody stops by and sees it. Mm. Are there stories less valid? No, Mm. but the stories don't get told. So if this house can do anything, it can help keep these stories and be a springboard. You know, there's more that is going on in the world that it relates back to fight for equality. Last year, I made an effort to, in mid-pandemic, to go to the, the Black Lives Matter rally in Valley Junction. And I talked to some of the folks who put it together, and they specifically picked Valley Junction because of James Jim Jordan's Jordan. history. That's a way to tie in the past and the present with hopefully an improved future. That it, makes me really proud. Interesting. We pivoted last year because schools, you know, they couldn't come. Yeah. So we started doing live virtual tours at no charge to schools all over the country. Mm-hmm. Our first one was a teacher in Illinois who is actually. James Jordan's great, great, great granddaughter. There might be one more great in there. And she is biracial. And she has a fantastic tattoo of this house. And she said it gives her such joy and inspiration to think that her black ancestors may have been helped by her white ancestors to get to Mm. freedom. Mm. That means something. I would like to think that this house could be a symbol for that kind of future, that not every interaction between human beings has to be bad. With everything that was going on at that time in 19th century and Mr. James Jordan and his likes, his kinds like Anderson Llewellyn, John Todd and all those guys, they knew they were breaking the law. They knew they were mm-hmm. crossing the lines. Why do you think they did it? They have nothing to gain. It seems like for a lot of these people, religion was a real factor, that Mm. they had very strong religious beliefs. 
that what is going on is wrong. But the slave owners also had strong religious beliefs. Funny how that works sometimes, <laughs> isn't it? How you can pick and choose. No, that was one of the major justifications oh, yeah. that was used yeah. is you're bringing these heathens to Christianity, so they owe you their lifetime of service because you're saving their soul. Mm -hmm. You're setting them up for the afterlife. That's interesting humanity, isn't it, <laughs> that you can read the same words, but get a different message out of it. Mm -hmm. So it just, it comes down to what's in your heart as a human being. I, it still happens today. People use religion, whatever religion, not just Christianity yep. to justify some pretty horrible things. Evil things. Why do you think we don't learn from the past? Past is uncomfortable. A lot of history is kind of painful. And I think uh, this is a kind of a personal point of view. You and I talked a little bit about expanding the Underground Railroad exhibit to include information about freedom seekers mm -hmm. and indigenous people. History is written by the, the majority. There are amazing stories out there of women and people of color who were equal parts on the Underground Railroad, but you're not hearing their yeah. stories. It's hard for me sometimes to look back at history because I'm like, okay— Women never did anything. People mm -hmm. of color was just like this passive sort of John Brown or Harriet Tubman swooped down and rescued him. The vast yes. majority of freedom seekers self-liberated. Mm -hmm. These were brave men and women who took this chance and they jumped into this void for the opportunity to be free. Mm -hmm. And I just think they're the ones who really need to be celebrated oh, yeah. on oh, equal yeah. footing of – yeah. Yes, James Jordan risked everything to help these people. But how about these folks who just took off north? And it, that's one thing I talk about on tours with the Underground Railroad. Think about it after you get to Canada. You, So you're there. You've made it against all odds. The Canadian government set up these amazing support systems and communities with schools. So you learn how to read and write. Who are you going to write? You can't send a letter back to your, your wife and kids saying, hey, I made it. What You should give it a try. Here's how I did it. Because they're not legally allowed to know how to read and yep. write. There were plenty of people who did, but pain of death, you had to keep that a secret. So you will never be able to get back in touch, most likely, with this family. And your family will never know if you actually made it to Canada or Mexico that's heartbreaking, too, when you think about it. Because you basically, when you make that decision to say, okay, I'm going to try to become free, that means that decision of you becoming free, you probably separate yourself from your family member. You might not see them ever again. Unless you are recaptured and brought back to the, the plantation, to your master, and they choose to, A, let you live, B, not sell you, you would never know. At, right after the Civil War, there were newspapers that were just full of ads from family members trying to find one another. Yeah. So where was Mr. Jordan buried? Here in Des Moines? Yes. Okay. Well, in West Des Moines, yes. He and neighbor donated the land that eventually is known as the Jordan Cemetery, which is on Fuller Road. Oh, oh really? Yes. So he <laughs> does something. He and both wives and almost all of the kids are buried, oh, buried there. there. So. Okay. Oldest daughter, Ella, is actually buried at Woodland Cemetery, where a lot of those, the freedom seekers are buried. She married Dr. George Hanawalt. He was very successful, well-respected physician, ended up being an important part of the Iowa National Guard, and there is an elementary school named after him as well. And there was a horrible train crash on Little Four Mile Creek, and George Hanawalt was one of the first uh, people there and started organizing the rescue parties, and it was an advanced train. There were some people on it from P.T. Barnum Circus because they were going to do a show here. So they were killed, and P.T. Barnum was so impressed and appreciative of what Dr. Hanawalt did they came back and did a circus performance and gave him all of the money mm. for it. 
and he was able to open up a series of cottage hospitals that eventually became the Methodist Medical Center. Wow. So there's all of these kind of tentacles of history. Yeah. Yeah. Did he pick this location to build a home just because of the route for the freedom seekers or not? No. This just happened to be available. This was a really prime place, especially if you are having uh, cattle, open grazing cattle, because Jordan Creek is just right behind us. So you've Mm. got a water source very close. There are absolutely magnificent oak trees and walnut trees in the area to make an amazing house. And it just worked out really well that this this would be a good place to have a farm. And his brother got the same sort of area about 10 miles away. So they were very close to each other. Should I assume that everything in West Des Moines named Jordan, they named after him? Like yes. Jordan Creek Mall? Yep. Well, there's a lot of West Des Moines names, like Ashworth Road. Mm. You know, that's named after two brothers. Okay. I'm going to start thinking about that. Yeah. There are a ton of E.P. True Parkway. E.P. True yeah. was a person. Okay. He was okay. a city manager, I believe. So, okay. Yeah. If James Jordan woke up today and see the way we're living as a people and the relationship we have with one another, what do you think his thought will be? First off, he was very anti-alcohol, so oh. he would be pretty appalled. With at how many bars we have? How many bars? They actually moved away from here to Des Moines because Valley Junction, after it became a train town, way too many bars. So oh, they wow. that was one of his real regrets later in life because you know he brought brought the the railroad here. He was really quite peeved about how many establishments there were that served alcohol. So wow. he would be really annoyed with how prevalent al- alcohol is in our society. I would like to think that he would be really happy with how the house looks, that we have been respectful to his his vision and his designing. He would be blown away at how many other buildings there are and stuff. Cause you know, this was, yeah, this was nothing around here. Oh and yeah. Want, where the heck are the farms? Where, mm-hmm. what, why are you tearing down all of the cornfields to build apartment buildings? As far as society, I would like to think that he would think this is a culmination of what he and John Brown and everybody in Tabor uh, up and down the line risked their own lives for, that this is what was supposed to happen. This, again, is that kind of complexity of humanity. Not every abolitionist believed in equality. Mm -hmm. There were people who were part of this, of the Underground Railroad, because they knew that the economic model of slavery was not going to last. It just, it's not viable. So when that went down, there were going to be all of these people who they didn't want to have living next door. So Mm. Canada wants them, take them. Send them to Canada. Or let's establish Liberia and ship them off there. Mm -hmm. So some people were part of the not in my backyard abolitionist Mm -hmm. movement. Yeah. I wonder what James Jordan would say when he realized there's electricity in this house. (laughs) He would probably be so freaked out. (laughs) But from what I have heard, the last Jordan family member lived here until 1947. So when they moved in before that, the wife, one of her requirements is that it would be electrified and have indoor plumbing. Mm. So that w- it wasn't kind of updated until the 40s. Take us back, actually. When you give people tour in this house, the how people lived in the 19th century, because we were looking at that kitchen yeah. The so-called washer. Just just give little highlights of their life was because some of this stuff I cannot picture myself that you use the same water to take a bath. That everybody else did before you? Yeah. I, I am a wuss. I mean, I, I go camping, like honest to God camping, tent, things like that. I'm used to being grubby and smelly for a couple of days and cooking over a campfire and all of that. Day in, day out, I wouldn't make it. 
I just can't even imagine what that would be like. I mean, you, especially if you are a woman, you are getting up. Hopefully you've banked the fire in your cook stove well the night before so you don't have to start from scratch. But you still have to clean out all the ashes and all of that. That's why you have a lot of kids. Yeah, Get a kid to work on going out to the well and hauling in some buckets of water so you can start cooking your first of three meals a day. And I don't know if you've ever cooked on a wood stove. No. There is a science to it. And you've got to be able to judge oak versus pine for how much heat you want and what you're going to be cooking. It's it's intellectual. That's where we need to find out what Melinda knew. Yes. Oh, she... Because <laughs> that's a science. It, it really is. You have got to be able to wrangle all of that and meal plan and still garden. Mm-hmm. And are you telling me that, especially in the early days, the women aren't in there equally with the men helping with slaughtering the pigs and shearing the sheep and that kind of stuff? Mm-hmm. I mean, you talk to any farmer today... And you have just a small idea of what they went through, but without modern conveniences like, oh, indoor toilets and (laughs) things like that. You are cooking constantly, trying to keep people alive because there's no tetanus shots. Mm -hmm. There's no penicillin. Mm -hmm. You know, Bobby has a sore throat on Sunday and by Saturday he's laid out in the parlor it would be yeah. terrifying. Yeah. No. Now, how far is the the well? What we think is we have kind of a replica or a duplicate well out there that that's where it was. So okay. Not that far away. Not, okay. But think about now. We're in a drought. How how deep is that well? Yeah. Is it still going or not? That's why it's nice that there's the creek that's not that far away. So you had a backup plan. Okay. Definitely. So they'll bring this water and dump in this tub. Mm-hmm. And they will take a bath. No, they didn't dump it in the tub because that would be wasteful. You heat up the water and you get a couple cups of it. You pour it over your head. You wash off. You rinse off a couple more cups of water. So now you've got, what, two inches of water in that tub. Next person comes in, stands there in the water, does the same thing. So now you got four inches of water. And you just keep the next person down the line is just kind of squatting in the tub, washing off until you get to the baby, which not everybody did it that way, but a lot of people would wait till everybody else had bathed and then you put the baby in the water because babies tend to go to the bathroom when they hit the warm water. Mm. So you're not going to start off with that. That is allegedly where the phrase, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater comes from. You could lose your baby in that mucky murder murky water that 12 other people have been adding to Mm -hmm. oh my goodness and i'm assuming probably like this place maybe james jordan was gonna go first that's kind of what we are thinking that that's pretty traditional men go first yeah and then then wife yep oldest son oldest oldest daughter ping pong and your way down you're the last one you're gonna be in everybody's water yes oh and then uh you know so you've got you got an outhouse that you're using but it's the middle of January in a driving snowstorm. You're not going to want to go out to the outhouse. So that's why everybody has a chamber pot mm. under their bed. So you use your chamber pot. And, you know, if you're James Jordan or Melinda or Cynthia and you got kids, get the kids to do it. So allegedly it, that was the job of the youngest child in the family. When they got old enough to be able to carry the chamber pot and not spill it. Yeah. Because that's the important part is the not Don't spilling. Spill if you were an only child, you would never get away from that job. <laughs> you would be so excited when your younger sibling got to the age that they could take over chamber pot duty. Now, it, it makes sense, though, why would they would have that many kids back then. Yeah. Because there was a lot of work. Oh, gosh, yes. Somebody, Especially on a farm. Yeah. Kerosene lanterns, you got to wash the glass part of the lantern every day because it gets smoky and that cuts back on the amount of light. So you got to be climbing a ladder and cleaning these lanterns and refilling them and polishing the stove because you're cooking with coal or wood. So you've got ash and smoke. They had to go kill something out there, bring it home. And I'm sure 
almost all these guys were hunters. Oh, they'd have to be. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And in fact, um, in James's office, one of the artifacts we have is a rifle that was given to James from John Brown. And what a useful gift that is because yeah. you're defending your property and you're going out and finding dinner. Because at that time, how many houses do you think there was oh, the around nearest, here? The nearest neighbor was 15 miles away. So, no, he was on his own. One of the first winters they were here, the very first winter they were here, it was really mild. But a couple of years on, it was a really hard winter. And James and a bunch of neighbors had to get together and go on a wolf hunt. The winter was so bad, all of the deer and rabbits died and wolves were coming into the farm areas and taking chickens and cattle to eat because they were starving. He um, got pretty bit up. They were on a raccoon hunt, and he reached into a tree stump to get a raccoon that he thought was dead and wasn't, and it ripped him up. Oh, God. So, yeah, there were dangers just everyday life, much less, you know, Mm -hmm. ravenous critters. When you look around today in Iowa, maybe even in our Iowa legislation, who would you compare to James Jordan? Or even in the society? Look, look around us. Who would you say, oh, gosh, yeah. You know who I really admire greatly is Jimmy Carter. There is somebody who has taken his, his notoriety, his influence, and done amazing things for Habitat for Humanity. And he is a deeply religious man. His soul compels him to help the less fortunate. I really, politics aside, I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about what this man has done, well, and his wife too, Yeah, with their lives after the White House. They could have done... Think of what some other former presidents yeah, they could do. Pay, could be paid a million dollars for speech. Exactly. Yeah. So those people are out there still mm-hmm. doing the hard work. What lesson this house is teaching us and James Jordan is teaching us today? I think one of the lessons is it's never wrong to do the right thing. Ooh, that's powerful. I understand that he was a rule breaker. Mm-hmm. I get it. What rules... Examine yourself. What rules are you willing to break? Because in your heart of hearts, you know they cause undeniable harm to a fellow human being. I think we have to have that opportunity to have self-reflection. That is why history is important. It offers us this opportunity to look at our own lives, parallel decisions that people 170 years ago made and decide, are we willing to make those hard decisions about our society, our community, and our world? And that's why to preserve historical places is very important. Yes. You have to have context. This is an amazing building. It is nothing without the story. And the building helps us tell that story. So that's why preservation of these sort of homes is critical. Amen to that. Anything else you want to add, Gil? I just want to come see us. Come learn about this house. Where can we find you? Look at us at WDMHS.org. I am personally really proud. We have new exhibits here since probably even last time you were here. Mm -hmm. That's been a real push for us to, we are the West Des Moines Historical Society. So we have exhibits that celebrate the people and the places and the things that happen that make this part of Iowa fantastic. The railroads coming here pushed racial integration with the Mexican Americans and the Mexicans and um, I mean Slavic people Mm -hmm. and African Americans coming up here to work on the railroads. Yeah. We are diverse mm-hmm. because of the of actions of people like James Jordan. Yep. So I love that. Amen. Amen. Do you guys have a Facebook page people can follow you? Oh, page? yes. Yep. Okay. Look, West Des Moines Historical Society. Okay. That is probably the best place to find out updated information on tours and special events. We're really proud. We are able to now offer uh, American Sign Language mm. on 
private tours. People just have to give us a couple weeks' notice so we can get somebody hired at no extra charge. We're going to start offering free monthly kind of public ASL tours to getting people access. I think a lot of us last year who don't have an obvious physical situation, disability, finally understood what it's like for many of our brothers and sisters who can't go to a museum, who can't because they can't hear what the tour guide is saying. So that's why we're doing ASL. We are looking into um, descriptive tours for people with vision loss. Mm. We can't put in an elevator to the floor, to the second floor, to the basement. So we're going to be doing a video that has a descriptive service to it so yeah. people with vision loss can tour the house. Mm. That's going to be what our future is, is including everybody yeah. in this opportu- learning opportunity. And that's, that's what history is about. Yeah. Just including everybody, everybody can learn and understand it. How can the society and community support you guys? Become a member. Okay. You know, this is a story as old as time. Funds are not that prevalent for history. Even though we do pretty critical education to thousands of school, school age kids every year, become a member or volunteer to help out on a committee. I mean, it's something as simple as we need help weeding the gardens. We want to put in historical, historically appropriate vegetable gardens, which we've done the last two years, and we donate all the produce to the West Des Moines Food Bank. Okay. Come help us weed. Yeah. It's hard to, to find folks sometimes. Volunteer. But, yeah, if you think the lessons and the mission are important – Become a member. It's $25 a year to be a member. Oh, really? And you help us keep the lights on and the doors open. Uh, Is there any book about James Jordan that has been written? Yes. uh, There is a local author, Louise Gately, who's written a book about his life and times that delves more deeply into his family's history. Okay. And we have copies of that here at the Jordan House for purchase. Okay. And if so if somebody needs the book, can they get it anywhere else? Or just, they just need to call the Well, the they, house? they can, but we'd rather have them buy it from us. From you. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. You know. Gotcha. Okay. I'm going to send business elsewhere. I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean, as, as, as long as the earth is still making the money. Yeah. That's, that's good. Yeah. Well, Gail, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for what you do, and I appreciate your time. I appreciate you coming here and talking to me. I think this is the way to get people to know about the awesomeness that is Iowa. Absolutely, absolutely. And we're going to make sure people know by telling the stories. Wonderful. Thank Thank you. you. That's it, man. That was Gail Brubaker, the Executive Director of West Des Moines Historical Society. Thanks for listening to the Iowa Civil Rights History Podcast. Until next time, be safe.